Today I'm going to be talking about the most famous artist that you've never heard of, Edward de Vere, who wrote under the pseudonym William Shakespeare. This may sound like a radical proposition, but pseudonyms have a proud tradition in the arts dating back to Homer and the Tao Te Ching. From Mark Twain to Marilyn Monroe, Lewis Carroll to Lady Gaga, an artist's pen name or persona can easily eclipse or even obscure their real identity. And in the case of Edward de Vere, there's a chance this may have even been intentional. In this video, I'll be painting with broad strokes, and past and future videos will delve more deeply into providing evidence related to Edward de Vere's authorship claim. My aim today is instead to provide a broader narrative contextualizing de Vere's need for anonymity and the steps that were taken after his death to obscure his true identity. We all learned the Stratfordian story in school. It's simplistic, inoffensive, and totally impoverished of any sort of detail that would stick in your head. It's actually exactly the sort of story you might use to deflect attention from a body of work that was highly scandalous in its time, exposing some of the greatest political controversies of the day. So if you can set aside your priors for a moment, I'm going to tell a story of how a legendary man named Edward de Vere was forgotten and came in time to be replaced by a character known as William Shakespeare. Let's look at the author image of William Shakespeare from the first folio, which was published in 1623. Ben Jonson's poem beside it says, Reader, look not on his picture, but on his book. In 1911, a tailor actually discovered that the jacket he's wearing is very strange. The right sleeve is actually just the back side of what the left side would be. Do you see how different the two sides are? The figure essentially has two left arms with the obvious connotation of deception or trickery. The jacket itself is impossible to construct as a garment, almost like one of M.C. Escher's optical illusions. There's also a notable crease down the side of the face, almost like he's wearing a mask. These quirks were not by accident. The specificity and attention to detail was executed with great difficulty by the engraver, and the image itself is huge, multiple times the size of typical author images during the period. It's wanting to draw your attention to this weird, disorienting image, but for what purpose? We'll come back to this in a moment, but first I want to talk about Hamlet. Scholars and theater lovers of all stripes have long suspected that the tale of the moody Danish prince has a whiff of the autobiographical and can provide unique insight into the elusive author's inner world. Stratfordians have a field day with the fact that the name Hamlet is nearly interchangeable with Hamnet, the name of Will of Stratford's son who died young of the plague. However, Edward de Vere's life also has some parallels with Hamlet. Here are a few. Hamlet draws from Beowulf, the only existing copy of which was possessed by Edward de Vere's tutor Lawrence Noel, who kept it in Cecil House where de Vere grew up. Hamlet's book from Act 2, Scene 2 is Cardanus's Comfort by Girolamo Cardano, which Edward de Vere personally commissioned to be translated into English when he was 23. It's accepted that Polonius, the interfering father of Hamlet's love interest Ophelia, is a satire of Edward de Vere's father-in-law William Cecil, Queen Elizabeth's spymaster and one of the most feared men in England. Polonius's famous To Thine Own Self Be True speech delivered to his son Laertes before his departure for France parodies Cecil's letter of advice to his son Robert before his departure for France. Polonius spies intrusively on Hamlet and Ophelia and pries on their letters. Similarly, William Cecil interfered with letters between his daughter Anne and her husband de Vere. Edward de Vere's brother-in-law was an ambassador to Denmark in the castle Elsinore in the 1580s, where he met one official named Rosencrantz and two named Guildenstern. There's an odd episode in Hamlet that happens while Hamlet is off stage on a sea voyage. Hamlet is reported to have been captured by pirates, stripped naked, and left ashore. In 1576, returning from a tour of his beloved Italy, de Vere was captured by pirates, stripped naked, and left ashore. Polonius alludes to young men, quote, falling out at tennis, referencing a 1579 scandal in which de Vere and his literary rival Philip Sidney had nearly come to blows on the Greenwich Palace tennis court, requiring the intervention of Queen Elizabeth. This is not an exhaustive list of Oxfordian references in Hamlet, and the Oxfordian references in Shakespeare's larger canon fill shelves of books. Uh, for starters, I particularly recommend Mark Anderson's Shakespeare by Another Name. However, I share these hoping that you might be willing to at least consider that the character Hamlet might have been a stand-in for Edward de Vere, and that the play might provide us with insights into his character and his tendency to write about people that he knew about at home and in court. Consider the scene in which Hamlet instructs a group of actors to perform his play before the court. The play is the thing wherein will catch the conscience of the king. Edward de Vere's first role as a dramatist was composing entertainments to be performed before Queen Elizabeth and other members of the aristocracy often making fun of his rivals at court, such as the Duke d'Alençon, a suitor for Queen Elizabeth's hand, and the inspiration for Bottom in A Midsummer Night's Dream. He would even use his platform to encourage Queen Elizabeth to extend her royal lineage, such as in Twelfth Night, where the noblewoman Olivia, refusing to get married, is complimented for her white and red features and told, Lady, you are the cruelest she alive if you will leave these graces to the grave and leave no copy. 
Edward de Vere's extraordinary gifts were remarked upon by his contemporaries, such as Henry Peacham and Francis Mears, who called him best for comedies. However, though many in the royal court knew of his activities, de Vere did not advertise the works as his own. This seems to have been something of a trend at the time amongst noblemen, as the Art of English Poetry, published in 1590, lists de Vere first among a cohort of anonymous noblemen producing excellent poetry but loath to be known for their skill. Philip Sidney, one of de Vere's rivals at court, was another such case, and today it's universally accepted that he wrote a cycle of sonnets under the pseudonym Astrophil in order to profess his love scandalously to a woman who was married. In 1586, Edward de Vere began receiving an enormous £1,000 annual payment from Elizabeth's entertainment budget. This was to pay for his work as a propagandist, creating rousing pro-Tudor war dramas like the Henriad plays at a time when England teetered on the brink of war with Spain, and Elizabeth feared losing the loyalty of her subjects. Though de Vere flourished under Elizabeth, his fortunes took a turn for the worse as she grew elderly, with government affairs increasingly handled by her cunning advisors. With no named heir, it was unclear who would become England's next ruler, setting the stage for a cutthroat Game of Thrones. Remember Edward de Vere's in-laws from Hamlet? His father-in-law, William Cecil, formerly Elizabeth's spymaster, had begun to transition power to his son, Robert Cecil, who famously suffered from scoliosis. Robert Cecil was determined to place James of Scotland on England's throne, but Edward de Vere was a major player in an alliance against this appointment. The famous hunchback Machiavellian Richard III was, in fact, a dangerously close-to-home satire of Edward de Vere's brother-in-law, Robert Cecil, at a time when Robert had instituted a massive censorship network to suppress dissent. This was a moment when your pen could cost you your life, as it did for Christopher Marlowe, as well as many other unfortunate writers. Referred to as the golden age of Elizabethan cryptography, nearly every writer of the day wrote under a pen name to escape political persecution, and indeed, in 1593, Edward de Vere debuted a new pen name, William Shakespeare. This name was not just a literary innuendo and a pseudonym, but also an alonym, a name borrowed from a real person. Many of the plays that we now call Shakespeare's were actually performed and produced for many years without any name attached to them. Will of Stratford became wealthy overnight, but it was not through writing, as he never saw any proceeds from these unauthorized publications, and even Ben Jonson, the most successful writer of the Jacobean era, lamented that he basically made no money from writing his entire career. Edward de Vere's widow had a strange bequest in her will, ordering the continuation of an allowance to her, quote, dumb man, until his death. Will of Stratford was likely paid by de Vere in assets like theater shares, as well as in cash, for the dangerous work of claiming his politically dangerous writings. Though this might sound like an outrageous claim, in fact, there are famous historical precedents for aristocrats hiring dumb men for their writing, dating back to ancient Rome. The Roman playwright Terence, formerly an African slave, was regarded even in his lifetime as being the front for an anonymous Roman consul, and his scripts coyly alluded to this arrangement. An Elizabethan poet, Joseph Hall, wrote a satirical poem with references to Venus and Adonis and Love's Labor's Lost about an anonymous court poet called Labeo, who liked to write behind a hyphenate pseudonym perhaps equating Edward de Vere to Quintius Fabius Labio, a Roman consul and poet linked to Terence. Let us return to the first folio, which was published 400 years ago, after both Will of Stratford and Edward de Vere had been dead for years. 1623 marked a traumatic time in English history. After Queen Elizabeth's long and relatively stable reign, tensions around a proposed royal marriage between Prince Charles and the Spanish Infanta threatened to erupt in civil war. As Catholic Spain gained influence over the English crown, a patriotic Protestant faction vocally opposed the impending marriage. This Protestant movement was spearheaded by Edward de Vere's descendants, including his son and heir Henry, who was imprisoned for opposing the marriage the year that the first folio was produced. Other leading figures were the Earls of Montgomery and Pembroke, to whom the first folio is dedicated. Montgomery was married to Edward de Vere's daughter Susan, and Pembroke had been engaged to Bridget de Vere. These were the people who risked their lives to compile Edward de Vere's greatest works and publish them as a political statement during this time of unprecedented censorship. Who is this strange-looking person? We have no verified portraits of the man named William from Stratford-upon-Avon, and I would argue that this figure was meant to be regarded as more of a mascot or symbolic figure than a real person. Julie Bianchi's research uncovered the numerous visual puns in Will's getup that have been obscured by the intervening 400 years. And Bonner Cutting has argued convincingly that this portrait was actually based on a painting of de Vere's favorite daughter, Susan, who was likely the possessor of her father's manuscripts. Today, mainstream scholarship takes the first folio at face value, insisting the timing of its publication was merely coincidental and that its many strange features are innocent quirks. Ironically, this is what Edward de Vere's descendants hoped for as they attempted to spread a highly subversive political message under the nose of authorities eager to suppress it. There are many modern examples of beloved political figures who become signals of resistance, even after their deaths. 
Edward de Vere was one such personality, and it's impossible to overstate the impact he had on those who knew him. Listen to these lines from the closing of Ben Jonson's poem in the first folio, eulogizing the author of the plays. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere advanced, and made a constellation there. Shine forth, thou star of poets. This is beautiful poetic imagery, but it's actually referring to a real astronomical phenomenon that occurred in 1604, right after de Vere's death. Kepler's supernova exploded across the heavens in 1604, and to this very day it remains the only supernova confirmed to have been witnessed by the naked eye. This star was brighter in the sky than any other, and was even visible at times during the day. Shakespeare's favorite literary source to pull from is Ovid's Metamorphosis, which tells many tales of heroes transformed by the gods into constellations, to reign immortal in the skies after their deaths. How fitting it must have seemed to those who loved Edward de Vere to see the greatest of all writers immortalized as this star of poets and how dangerous such a legendary hero would have been to his enemies. This has been a breezy overview of Edward de Vere's life and times, and the role that his writing played in the political world that he inhabited. Though I regret that brevity has required a sacrifice and thoroughness, I hope this has provided some food for thought. Like and follow for more, and check out the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship on their website for more resources on Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford.